once upon a time, in the ancient world of mathematics, there existed a vast and uncharted territory known as geometry. Among its many landscapes, the circle stood as one of the most fundamental and fascinating figures. Scholars from different civilizations pondered over its properties, striving to understand its mysteries. In ancient Greece, around the 5th century BCE, the mathematician Hippocrates of Chios began to explore the properties of circles. He discovered that the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of any circle was a constant, which we now know as pi, pi. This discovery laid the groundwork for understanding circles, but the journey was far from over. Centuries later, another great Greek mathematician, Euclid, took the stage. In his monumental work, Elements, Euclid defined the circle and described many of its properties. However, the concept of the unit circle, a circle with a radius of one unit, had yet to emerge. The development of trigonometry in the Hellenistic period brought new insights. Hipparchus of Nicaea, known as the father of trigonometry, created the first known trigonometric tables. These tables helped astronomers and mathematicians relate angles to the lengths of chords in a circle. Yet, the specific notion of a unit circle still eluded them. Fast forward to the Islamic Golden Age, where scholars like Al-Khwarizmi and Al-Batani made significant contributions to mathematics and astronomy. They translated and built upon Greek works, including those on trigonometry. Their efforts brought the mathematical community closer to a more refined understanding of circles and angles. It was during the Renaissance, with the revival of classical knowledge and the dawn of new ideas, that the concept of the unit circle truly began to take shape. Mathematicians such as Regiomontanus and Copernicus explored trigonometric functions more deeply, recognizing the importance of standardizing the radius of the circle to one unit for simplicity and consistency. In the 17th century, the unit circle finally solidified its place in mathematics. The French mathematician François Viet and his successors used the unit circle to define trigonometric functions. They understood that by fixing the radius at one unit, the sine, cosine, and tangent of an angle could be directly related to the coordinates of points on the circle. The unit circle became a powerful tool for solving problems in trigonometry, allowing for the visualization of angles and the relationships between different trigonometric functions. It provided a geometric interpretation that was both intuitive and elegant. As the centuries passed, the unit circle found applications in various fields, from physics to engineering, and even in the emerging field of complex numbers. It became a cornerstone of mathematical education, a simple yet profound concept that continues to inspire and enlighten students and scholars alike. And so, the story of the unit circle is a testament to the collaborative and cumulative nature of mathematical discovery. From the ancient Greeks to the Renaissance thinkers, and beyond, the development of the unit circle exemplifies the timeless quest for knowledge and understanding that defines the spirit of mathematics. The story of the unit circle is enriched by contributions from scholars across the world, including significant advancements from India during the classical period. Indian mathematicians and astronomers made remarkable strides in trigonometry, which laid the groundwork for the concept of the unit circle and trigonometric functions. Around the 5th century CE, the renowned Indian mathematician and astronomer Aryabhata made significant contributions to trigonometry. In his seminal work, the Aryabhatiya, Aryabhata introduced the sine function, ja, and produced tables of sine values for various angles. His work marked a departure from the Greek approach of using chords, instead focusing on the half chord, which we now call the sine function. Aryabhata's sine table was accurate and provided a foundation for later advancements in trigonometry. Building on Aryabhata's work, Another prominent Indian mathematician, Varahamahira, also contributed to the development of trigonometry in the 6th century CE. In his encyclopedic work, the Brihat Samhita, Varahamahira provided further trigonometric calculations and applications, demonstrating the practical utility of these concepts in fields like astronomy and astrology. 
The tradition of mathematical excellence continued with the work of Bhaskara I in the 7th century CE. Bhaskara I provided detailed explanations and improvements on Aryabhata's sign tables, further refining trigonometric calculations. He also introduced the concept of the versine, versin equals 1 minus cos, which played a role in the development of trigonometric identities and relationships. One of the most significant contributions came from the 12th century mathematician Bhaskara II, also known as Bhaskaracharya. In his monumental work, the Siddhanta Shiromani, Bhaskara II presented comprehensive treatments of trigonometric functions, including sine, cosine, and their inverses. His work on these functions and their relationships can be seen as precursors to the modern understanding of the unit circle and its role in trigonometry. The Indian scholar's method of relating trigonometric functions to the circle influenced the later development of the unit circle concept. By focusing on the half chord, sine, and its properties, they provided a framework that made it easier for later mathematicians to visualize and standardize trigonometric functions on a circle with a fixed radius of one unit. In summary, the contributions from Indian mathematicians like Aryabhata, Varahamahira, Bhaskara I, and Bhaskara II played a crucial role in advancing trigonometry. Their work laid the foundational principles that would later integrate into the broader concept of the unit circle, illustrating the interconnected and global nature of mathematical progress. Once upon a time, in the heart of the modern mathematical kingdom, the unit circle stood as a powerful and unifying symbol. Its origins were ancient, rooted in the works of the great scholars of Greece and India, but its influence had grown immensely in the contemporary world. The story of the unit circle in modern times begins with a group of curious students in a bustling classroom. Their teacher, Ms. Harper, stood before them with a smile, ready to unveil the secrets of the circle. Today, we'll explore the magic of the unit circle, she announced, her eyes sparkling with excitement. With a wave of her hand, Ms. Harper drew a perfect circle on the board, its center at the origin of a coordinate plane, and its radius precisely one unit long. This, she said, is our unit circle. It may seem simple, but it's a gateway to understanding so much of the world around us. She began by explaining how the unit circle helps define trigonometric functions. Imagine an angle theta, measured from the positive x-axis. As we move around the circle, the coordinates of our point are cos, sin. These are our beloved cosine and sine functions, which help us understand waves, oscillations, and even the rhythms of music. The students were captivated, but Ms. Harper was just getting started. She ventured into the realm of complex numbers, where the unit circle revealed even deeper mysteries. In the complex plane, she said, every point on the unit circle represents a complex number of the form cos plus isen. This is Euler's formula, and it's the cornerstone of so many mathematical theories. Ms. Harper illustrated how Euler's formula linked trigonometry to the exponential function, showing how it could describe everything from the swinging of a pendulum to the quantum states of particles. The students marveled at how a simple circle could be so profound. Next, she took them on a journey into the world of Fourier transforms. Here, she said, the unit circle helps us break down complex signals into simple, periodic components. This is the magic behind digital music, image processing, and even the way we compress videos. The students imagined the world of signals and frequencies, understanding that every sound they heard and every image they saw could be analyzed using the unit circle. The circle's power seemed limitless. But Ms. Harper wasn't finished. She revealed how the unit circle played a key role in computer graphics. When we create animations or render 3D objects, we use the unit circle to calculate rotations and transformations. It's what makes our favorite video games and movies come to life. The students envisioned the heroes and worlds of their beloved games, all brought to existence through the mathematical prowess of the unit circle. As the lesson drew to a close, Ms. Harper shared one more secret. In machine learning and data science, she said, 
the unit circle helps us understand the patterns and relationships in complex data. It's a tool that guides us in making sense of the vast amounts of information in our digital age. The students sat in awe, realizing that the unit circle was not just a geometric shape but a bridge connecting countless domains of knowledge. It was a testament to the unity of mathematics, science, and technology, all woven together by this simple, elegant figure. And so, in the modern world, the unit circle continued to inspire and enlighten, a timeless symbol of the interconnectedness of all things mathematical. Its story, ever-evolving, was a reminder of the endless wonders that lay hidden in the world of numbers, waiting to be discovered by curious minds. Welcome everyone to our presentation on the Riemann Hypothesis. Today, we will explore some of the most fascinating aspects of number theory and delve into one of its most enduring mysteries. Euler's initial work. We begin with the remarkable contributions of Leonhard Euler. In the 18th century, Euler made groundbreaking discoveries in understanding infinite series. He introduced the idea that the harmonic series, which is the sum of the reciprocals of the positive integers, could be expressed as a product over prime numbers. This was a revolutionary insight, as it linked the seemingly simple harmonic series to the complex and profound properties of prime numbers. Euler's formula was one of the first indications of the deep connections between primes and series. Basel Problem Solution Euler didn't stop there. He also tackled the Basel problem, which was concerned with finding the exact sum of the reciprocals of the squares of the integers. By examining the sine function and its product representation, Euler derived a formula for this sum. He showed that the sum of these reciprocals is equal to pi caret 2 6. This result was a significant achievement in mathematics and highlighted Euler's ability to uncover connections between different mathematical concepts. Riemann's analytical machinery. Moving to the 19th century, we encounter Bernard Riemann, who expanded our understanding of complex functions. Riemann introduced the concept of analytical continuation, which allowed for the extension of functions beyond their initial domains. For example, he extended the Riemann zeta function, which was initially defined only for complex numbers with real parts greater than 1, to the entire complex plane except for s equals 1 where it has a simple pole. This was a crucial advancement in complex analysis and paved the way for deeper exploration of functions. Riemann's zeta function. The Riemann zeta function is central to our discussion. For values of s with real parts greater than 1, it is defined as the sum of the reciprocals of integer powers. Riemann's extension of this function to all complex numbers, except s equals 1, revealed new dimensions of mathematical exploration. The zeta function became a key object of study in number theory and complex analysis, connecting various areas of mathematics. Dirichlet eta function. Riemann was also influenced by the Dirichlet eta function, defined by an alternating series. This function is closely related to the zeta function and provides valuable insights into its behavior, particularly for values of s less than 1. The relationship between the eta function and the zeta function is encapsulated in a simple formula involving the gamma function and powers of 2, which helps in understanding the zeta function's properties across different regions. Reflection properties One of Riemann's major discoveries was the reflection formula for the zeta function. This formula demonstrates a symmetry between the values of the zeta function at s and 1 minus s. Specifically, it shows that zeta, 1 minus s, can be expressed in terms of zetas using factors involving pi, the gamma function, and trigonometric functions. This reflection formula is fundamental to the theory of the zeta function and provides deep insights into its structure. Jacobi theta function. Riemann also made use of the Jacobi theta function, which has significant applications in various areas of mathematics. The theta function's series representation and modular properties were instrumental in Riemann's derivation of the functional equation for the zeta function. This equation is crucial for understanding the zeta function's behavior across the complex plane and highlights its intricate connections to other mathematical functions. 
Functional equation of the zeta function. The functional equation of the zeta function relates its values at s and 1 minus s through a complex expression involving pi, the gamma function, and trigonometric functions. This equation is a key result in the theory of the zeta function, showcasing its symmetry and the deep relationships between different mathematical concepts. Riemann's seminal paper. In 1859, Riemann published his seminal paper on the distribution of prime numbers, which introduced the zeta function and laid the groundwork for modern analytic number theory. This paper was a milestone in mathematical history and has had a lasting impact on the field, influencing subsequent research and discoveries. Riemann's hypothesis. Finally, we address the Riemann hypothesis itself. Riemann proposed that all non-trivial zeros of the zeta function lie on the critical line where the real part of s is half. This hypothesis has profound implications for number theory, particularly in understanding the distribution of prime numbers. Despite extensive numerical evidence supporting the hypothesis, a formal proof or disproof remains one of the greatest challenges in mathematics. The story of Riemann hypothesis continues. In a bustling town, Kolkata in India, there lived an accountant named Suraj. By day, he meticulously balanced books and ensured that every penny was accounted for, his life an intricate dance of numbers. But by night, Suraj's world transformed into something far more extraordinary. One day, while poring over some physics concepts, Suraj stumbled upon a reference to the dimensionless fine structure constant. This constant, a fundamental number in physics, had always intrigued him with its mysterious significance. As he delved deeper into its properties, another thought surfaced in his mind, a thought that linked this constant to something called Charles Constant, which he had encountered during one of his late-night reading sessions. Charles Constant was nearly half the value of the fine structure constant, and this curious relationship set Suraj's mind racing. Could there be a connection between these two constants? And if so, was it purely coincidental, or was there a deeper mathematical truth hidden beneath the surface? As an accountant, Suraj was accustomed to finding patterns and relationships in numbers, especially when it came to averages. He thought about the various averaging methods he used in his work, calculating the average inventory, average receivables, and average payables. These techniques, though simple, often revealed trends and insights that were not immediately apparent in the raw data. Could the relationship between the fine structure constant and Charles constant be similar? Could it be the result of some form of averaging, akin to the techniques used in accounting? The idea intrigued Suraj, and he couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more to this connection. With renewed energy, Suraj began to explore this possibility, applying the principles of algebra and intuition that had guided him so far. He knew that if there was indeed a link between these constants, it could be a crucial piece of the puzzle in his quest to understand the Riemann hypothesis. As he worked through the numbers, Suraj felt a familiar excitement building within him. This was the thrill of discovery, the joy of uncovering something new and unexpected. And though he was still far from his ultimate goal, Suraj knew that every step he took brought him closer to unraveling the mysteries of the universe, one equation at a time. Another day, as Suraj was browsing through a Wikipedia page on the list of unsolved problems in physics, something intriguing caught his eye, a link to unsolved problems in mathematics. Feeling curious, he clicked on it and began to scroll through the list, wondering what mathematical mysteries awaited him. As he scanned the page, a statement suddenly made him stop in his tracks. There it was, the Riemann hypothesis. Suraj had never heard of it before, but something about the problem drew him in. The hypothesis stated that the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function all had a real part of one half. This was the first time Suraj had encountered this problem, and he couldn't help but feel a strange sense of familiarity with the concept of half. In his accounting work, Half was a number he knew well, whether it was dividing assets, calculating averages, or finding midpoints. But here, in this grand unsolved problem of mathematics, it seemed to take on a new, 
almost mystical significance. Siraj pondered this idea. Could there be a connection between the simple notion of half that governs so much of his daily life and this profound mathematical problem? The idea seemed far-fetched, yet it also felt oddly intuitive. The more he thought about it, the more he was convinced that there was something here, something worth exploring. This moment marked a turning point for Suraj. The Riemann hypothesis had captured his imagination, and he couldn't resist the urge to delve deeper. He didn't fully understand the problem yet, but he knew that his journey into this world of numbers had only just begun. And as he sat back, staring at the screen, Suraj realized that this was the beginning of a new chapter in his life, one where his love for numbers might just lead him to uncovering one of the greatest mysteries of all. Suraj's journey into the world of the Riemann hypothesis led him to the works of one of mathematics' greatest pioneers, Leonhard Euler. Eager to understand the roots of the problem, Suraj started with Euler's exploration of the zeta function, which had laid the groundwork for so much of modern mathematics. He delved into the Basel problem, a famous puzzle that had baffled mathematicians for decades until Euler solved it with his remarkable ingenuity. Euler had shown that the sum of the reciprocals of the squares of the natural numbers was equal to pi squared divided by 6. This elegant solution amazed Suraj, not just for its precision, but for how it connected an infinite series to a fundamental constant, pi. As Suraj continued to explore Euler's contributions, he discovered even more about this mathematical giant. He learned about Euler's identity, often referred to as the queen or jewel of mathematics, which elegantly unified the trigonometric and complex exponential unit circles. The identity encapsulated five of the most important constants in mathematics, e, i, pi, 1, and 0, into a single, simple equation. Suraj was captivated by the beauty of this identity. The way it tied together seemingly disparate areas of mathematics resonated deeply with him, especially the idea of unification. In his mind, this unification was not unlike the balance and harmony he sought in his own work as an accountant. With each discovery, Suraj's fascination with the Riemann hypothesis grew. He began to see the problem not just as a daunting mathematical challenge, but as part of a larger tapestry woven through the history of mathematics, connecting the work of great minds like Euler. This newfound understanding inspired Suraj, fueling his determination to explore the hypothesis further and to seek out the hidden connections that might lead him to its solution. As Suraj delved deeper into Euler's work, he discovered a fascinating mathematical technique, Euler's trick of converting sums into products. This method, which connected the additive and multiplicative structures of numbers, intrigued Suraj. It was a simple yet profound insight that had allowed Euler to explore the properties of the zeta function in new and unexpected ways. Inspired by this idea, Suraj decided to take it one step further. He set out to calculate the infinite product of zeta values, both from the sum side and the product side, using an induction approach. His goal was to see if this method would reveal any new insights into the behavior of the zeta function, particularly around its critical points. As he worked through the calculations, Suraj arrived at a surprising result. According to his method, the value of the zeta function at s equals 1 seemed to equal 1. This caught him off guard, because he knew that zeta, 1, was known to be divergent, a fact first established by Nicole Oresme through his comparison test, and later confirmed by Riemann's functional equation, which showed a pole at s equals 1. This unexpected result presented Suraj with a new challenge. How could he reconcile his findings with the well-established knowledge that zeta, 1, was divergent? He realized that the answer might lie in the concepts of regularization or renormalization, mathematical techniques used to make sense of infinite or undefined quantities. The idea of dealing with essential singularities fascinated Suraj. These were points where a function behaved in a wildly unpredictable manner, and yet, there was a possibility of taming this behavior through careful mathematical manipulation. Suraj saw this as a clue, 
a potential key to unlocking a deeper understanding of the Riemann hypothesis. Driven by this new insight, Suraj immersed himself in the study of regularization and renormalization techniques. He knew that this was uncharted territory for him, but he was determined to explore it. After all, he had already come so far by trusting his intuition and applying simple, yet powerful, mathematical principles. This was just the next step in his extraordinary journey. Suraj knew that tackling renormalization was a daunting task, especially for someone with his background. He decided to take a step back and focus on something more manageable, something that still held the potential to reveal new insights. With his newfound understanding of Euler's methods, Suraj began to experiment. He injected the exponential form of complex numbers into Euler's sum to product form, a technique that intrigued him because of its elegant connection between different areas of mathematics. As he worked through the equations, Suraj found himself landing on a familiar and fundamental concept, the unit circle. The unit circle, with its perfect symmetry and balanced rotation, was a powerful visual representation of mathematical principles. Suraj realized that on this circle, the principle of symmetry was obeyed through rotation, with each step around the circle reflecting an additive identity. This discovery excited Suraj. He knew that symmetry was a fundamental aspect of mathematics, often hinting at deeper underlying structures. If he was right, then there must be more structural symmetries waiting to be uncovered, patterns that could potentially lead him closer to solving the Riemann hypothesis. Suraj's intuition told him that these symmetries were not just mathematical curiosities, they were essential clues, guiding him toward a deeper understanding of the zeta function and its mysterious zeros. With this in mind, he set out to explore the unit circle further, searching for hidden connections and patterns that could unlock the next piece of the puzzle. As he continued his work, Suraj felt a growing sense of anticipation. He was no longer just an accountant dabbling in mathematics, he was a seeker, on the verge of discovering something profound. The journey was far from over, but Suraj knew that he was on the right path, guided by the simple beauty of symmetry and the elegant dance of numbers. Suraj's intuitive search for symmetries led him to delve deeper into the mathematics that had always fascinated him. He began experimenting with basic algebra, using known values of the zeta function, including the intriguing result from Ramanujan that zeta, minus 1, equals minus 1 upon 12. This value, though counterintuitive, hinted at the rich and complex nature of the zeta function and its connection to the deeper structure of mathematics. As Suraj manipulated these values and explored symmetrical patterns around zero, he found himself drawn to familiar trigonometric identities. He noticed that his calculations began to converge on specific angles, particularly those involving pi 3 or pi 6. These angles were special, as they both equaled either square root 3 over 2 or half, a value that resonated with the geometric and algebraic symmetries he had been exploring. To his surprise, Suraj realized that these trigonometric values were not just coincidental. They seemed to be connected to the zeros of the zeta function in a subtle, yet profound way. The symmetry he had been searching for was beginning to reveal itself, weaving together the threads of algebra, trigonometry, and the complex structure of the zeta function. This discovery thrilled Suraj. He felt that he was on the verge of uncovering a hidden connection, one that could bridge the gap between the simplicity of high school mathematics and the deep complexities of the Riemann hypothesis. With renewed determination, Suraj continued his exploration, eager to see where this path of symmetry and intuition would lead him next. Suraj's journey had led him to a profound realization. He had found a compelling reason why the Riemann hypothesis must be true. The symmetries and patterns he had discovered combined with his understanding of basic algebra and trigonometry, had convinced him that the zeros of the zeta function were indeed aligned in the way the hypothesis predicted. But finding the reason was just the beginning. Suraj knew that to truly prove the Riemann hypothesis, he needed to move beyond intuition and provide a rigorous mathematical proof. 
The next big task ahead of him was to address the poles of the zeta function, which posed a significant challenge. As he studied the problem, Suraj observed that the poles of the zeta function could not be renormalized without first dealing with the poles of the gamma function. The gamma function, closely tied to the zeta function through the functional equation, had its own set of poles, and these needed to be carefully managed if he was to remove the singularities in the zeta function. This realization brought Suraj to a critical juncture. He knew that the task ahead would require meticulous work and a deep understanding of both functions. The poles, representing points where the functions blew up to infinity, were like obstacles blocking his path. To clear the way, Suraj would need to find a method to cancel or regularize these poles, making the zeta function well-behaved across the complex plane. With this new challenge before him, Suraj felt a mix of excitement and determination. He knew that he was venturing into complex and uncharted territory, but he also knew that this was the crucial step needed to solidify his proof. The journey had been long and filled with unexpected discoveries, but Suraj was ready to take on the final task and see his work through to completion. As Suraj delved deeper into the mathematics of the zeta and gamma functions, he encountered another intriguing issue. He realized that factorial functions, fundamental to many areas of mathematics, had no inverse, a fact that seemed to challenge the symmetrical principles of multiplicative identity. Factorials, which grow rapidly with each positive integer, did not have a straightforward inverse function. This was particularly problematic when extending the concept to complex numbers, as there was no functional representation for negative factorials. This absence of an inverse seemed to contradict the symmetric laws that underpin much of algebra and arithmetic. Moreover, Suraj discovered that factorials were not closed algebraically under complex numbers. Higher analogues of factorials, such as the gamma function, also faced limitations. The gamma function, though a generalization of the factorial function to complex numbers, still did not resolve the issue of negative factorials, nor did it provide a complete algebraic closure. This realization added another layer of complexity to Suraj's task. The lack of closure and the absence of inverses for factorials indicated that there were fundamental gaps in the algebraic structure he was working with. These gaps needed to be addressed to achieve a comprehensive proof of the Riemann hypothesis. Suraj knew that resolving these issues would require innovative thinking and a deep dive into advanced mathematical theories. Yet, despite the challenges, he remained undeterred. His journey had already taken him through unexpected discoveries and profound insights, and he was determined to navigate these new complexities as well. With every challenge, Suraj grew more resolute in his quest to unlock the mysteries of the Riemann hypothesis and complete his proof. To tackle the challenge of the factorial functions and their limitations, Suraj decided to innovate. He took inspiration from Euler's gamma function and created a new variant by shifting its argument down by one unit. This adjustment provided an additional depth, effectively removing the problematic pole at zero. This new function, which Suraj named the capital delta function due to its triangular appearance, proved to be self-recursive. It maintained a consistent one-unit distance from the gamma function, providing a useful modification to handle the issues he had encountered. Suraj was careful to distinguish his capital delta function from other delta functions in use, such as Dirac's delta function, which had a different role and properties. His capital delta function was designed specifically to address the challenges of the gamma function and its limitations. With this new tool at his disposal, Suraj felt more equipped to tackle the complexities of his proof. The capital delta function offered a fresh perspective and a potential solution to the problems he faced. As he continued his work, Suraj hoped that this innovative approach would bring him closer to a rigorous proof of the Riemann hypothesis bridging the gaps he had discovered and adding a new dimension to his mathematical journey. With the capital delta function ready, Suraj turned his attention to incorporating it into the Riemann zeta function's functional equation. This was a crucial step in addressing the poles and singularities that had previously posed challenges. 
The original functional equation for the zeta function involves several components. Suraj aimed to modify it by integrating his newly developed capital delta function. Here's how he approached it. 1. Incorporating the capital delta function, Suraj began by adapting the gamma function term in Riemann's equation. Instead of the gamma function, he introduced the capital delta function. The revised equation looked like this. The zeta function of s was now expressed in terms of the zeta function at 1 minus s, multiplied by other factors including the capital delta function. Specifically, the equation used the capital delta function to handle the singularities at zero. 2. Testing and verification. Suraj carefully tested this new equation across various values of s. He needed to ensure that the revised equation worked correctly and did not introduce any new issues. This involved comparing his results with known outcomes and verifying that the changes resolved the singularity problems. 3. Exploring implications. By integrating the capital delta function, Suraj hoped to simplify the zeta function's behavior, particularly around its poles. This adjustment aimed to provide a more stable foundation for his proof, helping to address some of the core challenges associated with the zeta function's singularities. This effort to rebuild the functional equation marked a significant step in Suraj's journey. It was a move towards resolving the complex issues he had encountered and advancing his work on the Riemann hypothesis. With this innovative approach, Suraj was hopeful that he was closer to achieving a breakthrough. The initial manipulation of incorporating the capital delta function into the Riemann zeta function's equation showed promise. However, deriving the complete alternate functional equation proved to be more challenging than Suraj anticipated. He faced several hurdles in ensuring that all components aligned correctly. To tackle these challenges, Suraj needed to 1. Exploit gamma functions reflection. The gamma functions reflection formula is a critical tool in complex analysis. Suraj used this formula to help manage the singularities and poles. This reflection property relates the gamma function evaluated at s and 1 minus s, providing valuable insights into its behavior across different regions of the complex plane. 2. Utilize zeta function's reflection. Similarly, the reflection properties of the zeta function were crucial. Suraj needed to carefully apply these properties to ensure that the alternate functional equation maintained consistency and accuracy. 3. Handle zeta function's limit. The behavior of the zeta function at various limits was another key consideration. Suraj had to ensure that the new equation correctly accounted for the zeta function's behavior as S approached specific values, particularly those where it exhibited known divergences or special properties. 4. Apply various translations and transformations. Suraj explored different translations and transformations to align the new functional equation with the known properties of the zeta function. These transformations helped manage the relationship between the zeta function and the capital delta function, ensuring that the new equation was both consistent and effective. Suraj's approach involved meticulous calculations and a deep understanding of complex function theory. Despite the challenges, he was determined to refine the equation step by step. Each adjustment brought him closer to a robust solution that could potentially resolve the singularity issues and support his proof of the Riemann hypothesis. As he worked through these complexities, Suraj's perseverance and mathematical intuition guided him. He remained hopeful that his efforts would lead to a significant breakthrough in his quest to solve one of mathematics' most profound problems. After much effort, Suraj had successfully derived the alternate functional equation for the Riemann zeta function, incorporating his capital delta function. The next crucial step was to test this new equation to see if it supported the proof of the Riemann hypothesis. To test the alternate functional equation, Suraj chose a specific value to evaluate it. He set the left-hand side of the equation to the zeta function evaluated at half. This choice was strategic, as evaluating the function at this point could reveal if the right-hand side of the equation approached zero in a generalized manner. Here's what Suraj did. 1. Setting the test value. 
Suraj substituted half into the left-hand side of the alternate functional equation. This choice was significant because the behavior of the zeta function at this point was of particular interest and could provide insights into the nature of its zeros. 2. Evaluating the right-hand side. By evaluating the right-hand side of the equation with the same test value, Suraj aimed to determine if it approached zero. If the right-hand side consistently approached zero when the left-hand side was set to half, it would suggest that the equation might indeed support the existence of zeros at specific points. 3. Interpreting the results. The results of this test were crucial. If Suraj found that the right-hand side went to zero in a generalized way, it would provide strong evidence that the alternate functional equation was correctly structured and that the zeta function had the desired properties. Suraj's careful testing was a significant step toward confirming the validity of his new approach. If successful, this test could bring him closer to demonstrating that the Riemann hypothesis holds true under his revised framework. With each step forward, Suraj felt a growing sense of excitement and anticipation, knowing that he was inching closer to solving one of the greatest mathematical puzzles. Suraj's test was a success. When he set the left-hand side of the alternate functional equation to the zeta function evaluated at half, he found that the right-hand side approached zero in a generalized manner. This was a significant breakthrough. The successful test meant that the alternate functional equation, incorporating the capital delta function, was behaving as hoped. It supported the idea that the zeta function could be aligned with the hypothesis about its zeros. This result validated Suraj's approach and provided a crucial piece of evidence for his proof. With this success, Suraj felt a renewed sense of accomplishment and motivation. His innovative use of the capital delta function and the careful derivation of the alternate functional equation had paid off. He was now closer than ever to proving the Riemann hypothesis. This milestone was a testament to Suraj's dedication, creativity, and deep understanding of mathematics. As he prepared to finalize his proof, he knew that the journey was not yet over, but this achievement was a major step toward completing one of the most challenging problems in mathematics. With the successful validation of his alternate functional equation, Suraj moved on to the next critical phase of his work, unification. This step involved integrating his findings into a cohesive framework that would solidify his proof of the Riemann hypothesis. Here's how Suraj approached the unification process. 1. Integrating the capital delta function. Suraj began by ensuring that the capital delta function was seamlessly incorporated into the overall framework of his proof. He needed to confirm that this new function worked harmoniously with the zeta function and did not introduce inconsistencies. 2. Aligning with existing theories, Suraj reviewed his results to ensure they aligned with established mathematical theories and principles. This included checking compatibility with known results and theories related to the zeta function, the gamma function, and other related functions. 3. Verifying consistency across equations, Suraj examined the consistency of his revised functional equation across various scenarios and values. He needed to ensure that the equation held true not just for specific cases, but in general, providing a robust foundation for the Riemann hypothesis. 4. Finalizing the proof. With everything in place, Suraj worked on consolidating his findings into a final proof. This involved clearly presenting his results, demonstrating how his approach resolved the key issues related to the Riemann hypothesis, and addressing any remaining concerns. 5. Ensuring rigorous validation. Suraj sought to validate his proof rigorously. He conducted thorough checks and possibly sought feedback from peers or experts to ensure that his proof was solid and free from errors. As Suraj approached the unification phase, he knew that this was a crucial step in completing his proof. Unifying his findings meant bringing together all the components of his work into a single, coherent argument. This final step would determine whether his approach could stand up to scrutiny and whether he could claim success in proving one of the most famous conjectures in mathematics. With determination and careful attention to detail, 
Siraj set out to complete this pivotal phase of his journey, hopeful that his proof would be a significant contribution to the field. Now over to Siraj for rest of the story. The quest for unification. At the heart of my proof lies the extension of the Riemann zeta function. The key was an alternate functional equation, one that emerged from the reflection properties inherent in both the zeta and gamma functions. This equation wasn't merely a mathematical curiosity, it became the linchpin of a deeper understanding. By weaving together this new variant of the zeta function with Euler's zeta function, I discovered a surprising harmony. These two distinct functions acted as harmonic conjugates, complementing each other in a dance of mathematical elegance. This union provided a unified framework, allowing the zeta function to transcend its previous limitations. The role of the dual unit circle. The unification led to a profound transformation of the zeta function. It evolved into an entire function, meaning it became holomorphic across the entire complex plane. But this transformation wasn't just about removing singularities, it reshaped the very nature of the zeta function's behavior. In this new form, the zeta function reaches its maximum modulus not within the traditional boundaries but beyond the unit circle, on what I describe as the boundary of the dual unit circle. This boundary became a critical region, revealing the peak of the function's amplitude. Conversely, the function's zeros, the elusive points that hold the key to the Riemann hypothesis, emerged on the half-unit circle, where the modulus is minimized. Complying with Liouville's theorem. This behavior aligns seamlessly with Liouville's theorem. The theorem, a cornerstone of complex analysis, asserts that a bounded entire function must be constant. However, the newly unified zeta function, unbounded in its domain, navigates through the landscape of the dual unit circle, obeying the maximum modulus principle in a way that resonates with Liouville's insights. A new perspective on an ancient problem. This narrative represents not just a mathematical proof but a new perspective on an age-old problem. By extending the zeta function through alternate paths and finding harmony in its dual nature, we uncover a structure that aligns with the deepest principles of complex analysis. The Riemann hypothesis, long considered insurmountable, may now have a new avenue toward resolution. This journey is a testament to the power of unification and the beauty of finding connections where none were previously seen. The zeta function, once constrained, now stands as a testament to the boundless potential of mathematical exploration. In any groundbreaking work, especially one as monumental as a proposed proof of the Riemann hypothesis, critique and skepticism are inevitable. The strength of my proof lies not only in the mathematical rigor but in the innovative approach that challenges traditional boundaries. Embracing novelty in mathematics. Critics may argue that extending the Riemann zeta function through an alternate functional equation is unconventional. However, history has shown that mathematical progress often comes from reimagining established concepts. The alternate functional equation derived from the reflection properties of the zeta and gamma functions is not an arbitrary extension, it is deeply rooted in the inherent symmetries of these functions. By exploring these symmetries, I've uncovered a new perspective that adds coherence to the zeta function's behavior. Harmony with established theories. Some may question the unification of the zeta function with Euler's zeta function, seeing them as distinct entities. Yet, in complex analysis, the concept of harmonic conjugates is well established. By positioning these functions as harmonic conjugates, I've created a framework that unifies their behavior, offering a more comprehensive understanding of their relationship. This unification is not a departure from tradition but an expansion of it, extending the reach of what we know. Addressing the behavior on the dual unit circle. The introduction of the dual unit circle and the function's behavior on its boundary may be seen as speculative. However, this approach is firmly grounded in the principles of complex analysis. The concept of dual structures is not new, it's a natural extension of the geometric interpretations of complex functions. The maximum modulus principle, as applied to the boundary of the dual unit circle, is a logical extension of classical theorems including Liouville's theorem. 
by demonstrating that the zeta function's zeros align with the minimum modulus on the half-unit circle, I've provided a concrete manifestation of this theoretical framework. Rigor and mathematical integrity. Critics might also focus on the need for absolute rigor. Every step of my proof has been carefully constructed, with a focus on mathematical integrity. The extensions and transformations I propose are not mere conjectures. They are supported by deep analysis and rooted in established mathematical theory. The new perspectives I introduce are not about bending the rules of mathematics but about applying them in innovative ways to reach new conclusions. The role of skepticism in advancing knowledge. I welcome skepticism as it is a vital part of the mathematical process. It ensures that ideas are tested, refined, and either validated or disproven. My work is open to scrutiny, and I encourage my peers to engage with it critically. If my proof withstands this scrutiny, it will only be stronger for it. If there are aspects that can be improved or refined, I am committed to addressing them, as my goal is the pursuit of truth, not the defense of an unassailable position. In defending my work, I stand by the innovative methods and rigorous analysis that have guided my proof. I believe that by embracing new perspectives and challenging traditional boundaries, we can move closer to resolving one of the most profound questions in mathematics. Critics may assert that any valid proof of the Riemann hypothesis must be derived exclusively from the classical Riemann zeta function itself, without involving variance or related functions. This view, while rooted in traditional approaches, overlooks the rich interplay between related mathematical objects and the potential of such relationships to unlock deeper insights. The power of harmonic conjugates. Harmonic conjugates are not mere mathematical conveniences, they represent a profound symmetry in complex analysis. By considering the Riemann zeta function in tandem with its harmonic conjugates, such as the alternate variant derived through the reflection properties of the zeta and gamma functions, we tap into a broader framework. This framework doesn't detract from the Riemann zeta function's centrality but rather enriches it, offering new pathways to understand its properties. Historical precedents in mathematical discovery. History is replete with examples where significant breakthroughs were achieved not by direct attack on a problem, but by exploring related functions or objects. For example, the relationship between the sine and cosine functions which are harmonic conjugates, is essential for understanding Fourier analysis. Similarly, the discovery of the analytic continuation and functional equation of the Riemann zeta function itself was a step away from its original definition, leading to deeper insights. Expanding the conceptual framework. The idea that a proof of the Riemann hypothesis must emerge strictly from the Riemann zeta function is based on a narrow view of mathematical exploration. In complex analysis, functions are often best understood in the context of their relationships with other functions. The use of variance as harmonic conjugates is not about sidestepping the problem but about expanding the conceptual framework within which the problem is considered. This expansion allows for a more comprehensive understanding, where the behavior of the zeta function can be seen in a new light. Unity and diversity, the zeta function and its variance. The assertion that only the Riemann zeta function should be used neglects the fact that variants of the zeta function, when considered as harmonic conjugates, still hold the essence of the original function. They are not separate entities but are intrinsically linked to the Riemann zeta function, sharing fundamental properties and behaviors. The unification of these functions brings to light a broader, yet coherent, picture of the zeta function's behavior across different domains. The role of generalization in proofs. In many areas of mathematics, generalization plays a crucial role in finding solutions. The Riemann hypothesis is not merely a conjecture about the zeros of a single function, but about the nature of these zeros in the context of analytic functions in general. By exploring harmonic conjugates, we are not abandoning the Riemann zeta function, rather, we are generalizing its properties to a broader context that might hold the key to the proof. Conclusion. Embracing broader horizons. Negating the claim that a proof must come solely from the Riemann zeta function itself, we argue for the legitimacy and potential of exploring related functions that act as harmonic conjugates. 
This approach does not dilute the proof but enhances it by providing a more robust and encompassing framework. The pursuit of mathematical truth often requires stepping beyond the immediate object of study to understand it within a wider context, one that, in this case, may very well include its harmonic conjugates. Clarification on the use of an alternate functional equation. In my proof of the Riemann hypothesis, the use of an alternate functional equation derived from the reflection properties of the zeta and gamma functions is a crucial element. This approach may raise questions, so it's important to clarify how and why this alternate functional equation is employed. 1. The role of functional equations in complex analysis. Functional equations are equations where the function itself is part of the equation, relating values of the function at different points. They are a powerful tool in complex analysis, often revealing deep symmetries and properties of functions. The classic example is the functional equation for the Riemann zeta function. This equation relates the values of the zeta function at s and 1 minus s, extending the function's behavior across the entire complex plane. 2. Derivation of the alternate functional equation. The alternate functional equation I propose is derived by carefully examining the reflection properties of both the zeta function and the gamma function. These reflection properties are well known in mathematics. By manipulating these properties, one can construct a new functional equation that is consistent with these reflections but provides a different perspective on the zeta function's behavior. This alternate equation is not arbitrary, it emerges naturally from the underlying properties of these functions. 3. Why use an alternate functional equation? The alternate functional equation serves several purposes. Extension of domain. It allows for the extension of the zeta function into regions where its traditional definition might be less informative or where different properties emerge. Unification with harmonic conjugates. This equation facilitates the identification of harmonic conjugates to the zeta function, leading to a broader framework where the zeta function and its variants can be unified. Insight into zeros and moduli. The equation helps reveal the distribution of zeros and the maximum and minimum moduli of the function in new, geometrically significant regions like the dual unit circle and the half unit circle. 4. Ensuring consistency with the original zeta function. It's crucial to note that the alternate functional equation is not a replacement for the original one but rather a complement to it. It maintains consistency with the Riemann zeta function's known properties while providing new insights that are not immediately apparent from the traditional approach. 5. Addressing concerns. Some may be concerned that introducing an alternate functional equation might deviate from the original problem's framework. However, Mathematical exploration often involves such extensions to gain deeper insights or to apply known tools in novel ways. The alternate functional equation enriches the understanding of the zeta function without contradicting its established properties. Conclusion The use of an alternate functional equation in my proof is a strategic and thoughtful approach that builds upon the established foundations of complex analysis. It allows for a richer exploration of the Riemann zeta function's properties and provides a pathway to address the Riemann hypothesis within a unified and comprehensive framework. This approach is both consistent with traditional mathematics and innovative in its exploration of new avenues. Clarification on the use of the delta function as a variant of the gamma function. In my proof of the Riemann hypothesis, the delta function plays a crucial role as a variant of the gamma function. This variant is derived from exploring the self-recurrence properties of the gamma function, leading to a deeper understanding of its relationship with the zeta function. The gamma function and its recurrence. The gamma function is a fundamental concept in mathematics, known for its self-recurrence properties. This self-recurrence means that the value of the gamma function at one point can be expressed in terms of its value at another, revealing a pattern of behavior that is key to many areas of analysis. Introducing the delta function. Building on the gamma function's self-recurrence, the delta function is introduced as a variant that captures some of the subtler aspects of this behavior. The delta function is specifically designed to interact with the zeta function in a way that complements and extends its properties. Why use the delta function? 
The delta function is integral to the proof for several reasons. Enhanced symmetry. It introduces additional symmetry to the mathematical framework, which is essential when seeking to connect the zeta function with its harmonic conjugates. Unification with harmonic conjugates.